Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for that redeeming love. Our salvation came at a great price. And so together today, Father, we say thank you. We come to be renewed, refreshed, to be washed pure and clean as we come to your table today, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. We invite you into this place. We thank you for that fountain which washes us. We who are dirty and rotten on the inside, you have made us clean by covering us with your blood. Thank you. Welcome to this place today. And it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Welcome to you this morning. We're glad you're here this morning as well as we are glad that God is here in this place today. We want to tell you about one event coming up in the life of our church tonight. We have Laugh All Night. Six o'clock, Ken King, uh, comedian Ken Kington will be here. We're going to have an opportunity to come back together tonight. Uh, just as we've gathered here this morning for a time of fellowship. And tonight, the real focus is going to be on fun, laughter, rejoicing, and, and the things. How many of you believe God has a sense of humor? Say amen. 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 I believe he does. Sometimes when I look in the mirror, when I get up in the morning, I know he has a sense of humor then. I tell you, it's good to be in God's house. It's good for us to come together as body of believers, to be unified in the spirit, to laugh together like we'll laugh tonight, to be reminded of our position in Christ as we are this morning, as we come to the table of the Lord. You know, it doesn't matter where you came from this morning or how far away you live the rest of the year. Every one of us who is here in this place today is here by divine appointment. God has something that he wants to say to you today. He has something he's already said to me, and I know he's got more that he's going to speak into my life. So every one of us has, needs to put up our spiritual antenna and say, Lord, speak to me today. Lord, I'm ready to receive the message you have for me. And we, as we do that, we welcome him into this place. We talked about being from different places. How many of you are from uh, Canada? Raise your hand. Anybody from Canada in here this morning? All right. Anybody from the north, uh, northeast, up there, New Hampshire, Maine, Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, up there, Boston, Massachusetts, New York, any of those, Pennsylvania. All right. So you got picked up some folks there. All right. How about uh, kind of the, you consider yourself Midwesterners? Yeah. <laughs> Big crew of those folks in here this morning. Amen. Glad you guys are with us today. Uh, how many of you from the south? <laughs> that almost always gets a whoop. You know what? We are just glad to be in God's house today. Amen? Amen. Stand to greet those around you and make everyone feel welcome. We invite you to sing with us. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and he carried the cross. Not so
Messiah. And we are free and free indeed because of the power of the cross, what he has done for you and for me, the power of his cross. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of gold. This the power. your attention to the baptistry. Village Baptist Church, this is not civil. This isn't civil what we do in baptism. It's an identity with an old, old story that God's been working out over and over again. And in His Son, 
I, with Paul, can say, I have been crucified with Christ. What we do here is an identity with the power of the cross in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Amen. Now what we're fixing to do, Brother Ron is a little nervous about this water. And with good reason. Because what it says is it says, I identify with a crucified Messiah who was also raised to life. Today, the hope this what this does is it speaks a word of the gospel to you. Because what we do when we become Christians is we can say that, that there is ne therefore no, now no condemnation for me. Because I am now in Christ and he bore my condemnation. So as we approach these uncivilized waters, we identify with Christ and him crucified. Ron, come into these waters. Welcome with me, Ron. Ron, in hearing Ron's story, in hearing Ron's story, he didn't come here to hear about the gospel, but as he heard about the gospel, it began to break his heart, and Ron began to weep, and he began to, he began to realize this was for him, this was for him, and so there may be many more of you out here today who, you didn't come to hear the gospel, but as you hear this testimony through baptism, and through the preaching of the word, that you would want to respond to the gravity and the grace given to you in Christ Jesus. I pray that that happens to you today. Ron, what is your sacred confession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Ron, based on that profession of faith, I baptize, baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised to walk in a new life. Speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speaks righteousness for me, who stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. That's your confession. Stand and sing it with us. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hear me, joy and gladness. Let, Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins, and blot out all my guilt. 
created in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and give me a willing spirit. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a Gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, wash away my guilt, cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Against you, and you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow.
rest in this place. Ken, Ken Youngblood is coming to lead us in a word of prayer as we dedicate our offering back to the Lord. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we have come here today to worship you. We pray that you would accept our worship of song, our worship of baptism, our worship of praise and adoration, Father, and, our, and the worship of the words that you've given our pastor today, Father, and also our worship as we gather at your table. And Father, also our worship of our gifts to you, Father. We just lay these at your feet right now, and we pray that they would be used to further your kingdom and to spread the gospel. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to dig in and we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper today, as you can guess. Everything in this worship service has, has pointed towards this event of the Lord's table. And in 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, we find that Paul is laying out to the Corinthians the purpose and the meaning and the provision of what we call the Lord's table, of what the Lord himself calls his table. 
Am I turned on? Okay. All right. Sometimes I can't tell up here if I, I don't hear the feedback and, and such. But the Lord Jesus Christ, before he was crucified, he, he told his disciples that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. You know, when Jesus Christ walked on the planet, there were a lot of neat and awesome things that he did along the way. You know, he walked up to those that were, were lame and sitting in the, in, in the sheep's gate, and he said, get up and take up your pallet and walk. And, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and that would have been a, a really glorious and, and awesome event to have witnessed. Gina was telling me at uh, Bible study the other night that, that she prayed so hard that that's what God was speaking to her from, from her position, that she could get up and walk. And, and, you know, we all want to be able to walk. When Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man, that was a, a miraculous event. To be able to see for the very first time, it would be absolutely overwhelming, would it not? And to know that the Lord had spoken the words of forgiveness to a broken and, and hurting heart would be so healing to one who felt lost and hopeless and un, uncared and unloved for. But now the Lord Jesus, he speaks to his disciples, but the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And what we dig into with that very thought is this. It's a, it's a thought of, of, of single importance and of single interest to the church of Jesus Christ because what we do today as we come around this table is a sacred act of worship. And I know one of the things that happens, you know, in, in evangelical churches such as, as a Baptist church or as an evangelical free church or, you know, uh, an Assembly of God church or a church of God, you know, oftentimes we don't use the terminology of sacred. What does it mean for, for it to be sacred? It means it's a holy event. This is a special event. It's not something that, that we just do each Sunday and, and pass through, but it's something that's special and sacred and set apart. It's a sacrament. Now, for some, when they hear that word sacrament, they're thinking, oh, it can't be a sacrament, but it is a sacrament. It's a sacrament in the sense that it is the grace of God extended toward us. This thing that we call communion. We correspond with God. And so we come before this table of the Lord because the deepest things in life are acted out rather than spoken, and the Lord's Supper is an outward demonstration of the inward work of Christ in our hearts and in our lives. This morning, as we come to the Lord's Supper, there are three major things that we need to understand about it. We need to understand that Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord of this table. We need to understand, secondly, that we come at, to this table in the unity of the Spirit. And thirdly, we do so after a period of personal examination. But what does it mean for Jesus Christ to be the sovereign Lord of glory uh, over this table? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23, Paul wrote and said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you. And this revelation of the Lord's Supper is associated then with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul said, that which I receive from the Lord, the Lord himself gave me this, and this is what I give unto you. And he talks about his Lordship, the sovereignty of his presence in the Supper. In 1 Corinthians 10, 21, the Scripture says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table with demons. Now, when we break this bread, we're virtually guessed where? We're virtually guessed in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he's reminding us, that he is the host of this table. He is the host of this feast. And in that process then, he becomes the object of our attention. Now, let me ask you a question. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have on your person one of these? Light them up. Yeah, turn them on. Light them up so I can see the screens. And you know what's so cool about it? These screens you can see from a distance, can't you? And do you know that oftentimes you can put them down and shut them down? 
Oftentimes when we come to worship, you know, we've been in here and we've been singing these great songs of praise to God, or at least the others have, because some of us find ourselves busy on our phone surfing the Internet. I even know about one guy up here in the balcony that brings his iPad and stays on Facebook the whole time. Well, Christ isn't the object of our attention when we're doing that, is he? Now, we, we can say, oh, man, we ought to put those phones down. Like, I can see Dr. Ralph's face lit up, but I know he's looking at the Scripture on his. <laughs> but, you know, we can point the finger, but you know what? Some of us are just as guilty because this is what we're thinking about. We're thinking, well, you know, I've got a lunch engagement. I've got a reservation. I've got to beat all those other snowbirds. Where do I want to send y'all today? I've got to beat all those other snowbirds to, to wherever. You know, we've got to get there before the Methodists do. We'll never get a seat. And we're rushing through that. And therefore, you know, we got these things going. You understand what I'm saying. And we get to thinking about what happened last night. And we get to thinking about what's going on right now. And Christ is not the object of our attention. And he's to be the object of our attention so that he can be the focus of our devotion. He is the sovereign Lord of this table. But secondly, in the sovereignty idea, we come across this. That we have the sovereignty of his provision. He said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in verse 20, it says, it is the Lord's Supper. Now, that term, that term right there, the Lord's Supper, it, it's what we call an um, adjective translation. I had to look that up. I was reading through commentary, and, and I'd never come across that before. And I said, that's kind of neat. People might want to know that adjective translation now some of you english people you know you understand all that stuff but what it does is it basically adds characteristics to the noun now when i grew up down here in the south we had uh, we had um dinner at, at lunchtime and supper at supper time I don't know what happened. The northern folks invaded down south, and now we have lunch and dinner. I don't know when I'm going to ever get another supper, <laughs> except right here. But, you know, we can identify suppers. We can all identify with that very simply. And, and uh, we all gather around tables and stuff. But this adjective translation means that it's the Lord's Supper. It's not just any supper, but it is the Lord's. It sets it apart. It's something that is both the sacrament, an act of God's grace, and it is something that is sanctified as being a holy moment. It's something that's called an ordinance, his command, and we gather around his table. It's his body. It is his supper. And there's a sovereignty then in that provision. You know, how would we ever come up with a menu for the Lord's Supper? But yet he does it very simply. He does it according basically to the custom that we find in, in that culture. And it's a simple meal of bread and wine, the, the basic substance of, of everyday life. I've been in North Africa in cultures that are very similar to what it was like in, in um, ancient Israel 2,000 years ago. Things have very little changed. And can I tell you, they never throw away a piece of bread. They don't throw bread away. Bread is an important substance in daily life. As a matter of fact, if they no longer have use for that bread, they would rather put it in the crack in the wall for the beggar to come and receive than to throw it out and to throw it away. I've had many meals with people in North Africa in the evening as we've been traveling through the mountains. And those meals, you know, were not a pot roast or even a leg of lamb. But oftentimes those meals are just fresh baked pieces of bread right out of the oven. And their cup was a hot tea. And that was the meal of the day. And so when Jesus takes this bread and he takes this cup, he's using two items that are so very familiar. And he says, this bread, this is what it represents. It represents my body. It's broken for you. And this cup, it represents my blood that's poured out for you. For without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of our sin. 
So we see he's the one who brings the provision. And he brings his, his purpose. He calls it, he calls us, you know, for he who eats and drinks, uh, eats drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And what he's talking about here uh, is, is, is two relevant things with that term body. First of all, the body of Christ given in sacrifice for the salvation of all people. If we don't judge it rightly, and I believe that judging it rightly involves this, that understanding that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. It's the only way into heaven. It's the only way to the throne of grace. And secondly, it refers to the body of Christ, which is the church. And so we need to understand that the church is God's given measure of grace to, to be the effective force for proclaiming the gospel all over the planet. And we then are to recognize not only the fact of the person of Christ Jesus who sacrificed himself on our behalf, but in that purpose, he is the sovereign Lord of glory over us. He's the sovereign Lord of glory. He is the one who's in control. He's the one who is the master. He's the one who has a complete authority over the direction of our lives and we submit to him and you know when we come together and we come to know jesus christ he does something marvelous and majestic in our lives he gives us a oneness and this is where paul speaks to the unity of the spirit in this thing called the lord's supper listen to his words in verse number 17 but in giving this instruction i do not praise you why doesn't he praise them? Because if you'll remember, as he opened up and began talking to the Corinthians in the very first chapter, he said, you know, you guys have got a problem. Some of you say, I'm of Cephas. Some of you say, I'm of Paul. Some of you say, I'm of this leader. I'm of that leader. And some of you try to be all spiritual and say, well, I just love Jesus. And nobody's really saying it out of the depth of, of their being and out of the depth of their heart, but there's only one Lord. That's what he's just laid out. And so, for, therefore, he says, I, I don't praise you in that respect. But, but by the time you get to chapter 12, verse 13, he says, But by one Spirit, by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were made to drink of one Spirit. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he talked about what Jesus Christ did in his death in bringing us together. He said there's no longer a dividing wall. He was saying that in the ancient temple, there was that ancient wall that divided the, 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 the Hebrews from the Gentiles. And that ancient wall, Jesus Christ himself had torn down and made one entrance into the Father by himself. And it's the one name by which men must be saved. And, and here the apostle is saying that the one place on earth then, because there's this one deal, this one place on earth where the church reflects her unity, is at the table of the Lord. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you are Baptist? Okay, quite a few at this service. How many of you are Presbyterians? Okay, a couple. Methodist. Um, Church of Christ. Meth um, did I say Methodist already? Okay, sometimes I forget. Um, Non-denominational. Um, Catholic. Episcopal. Anglican. Um, Calvary Chapel. You know, there's all kinds of different ones of us. But the one thing that brings us together is Jesus Christ. And the unity of this, of this body, the body of Christ, is demonstrated at this table. It's dem demonstrated as we take of this holy sacrament, this holy act of God's grace into our physical bodies today. There's a oneness that we have. You can look around and say, wow, I'm brothers and sisters with everybody in this crowd. Now, I know there's a couple of you look at and think, really? But yeah, you are. It's cool. Because when we get to heaven, you know, we're going to all rejoice together anyway. So we better practice while we're still here. That's that unity of the Spirit. Now, that unity of the Spirit is demonstrated in such a way that Paul writes to the Galatians and he says, there's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. 
And it's demonstrated through the covenant that we have, a covenant unity. Now, he says in verse 25 of chapter 11, in the same way he took the cup after, also after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And, and this word covenant, this is what it means. It means it's an agreement. It means that we're in, we're in agreement in celebrating this feast, and we show that we've come to an agreement with God. What's that agreement with God? We agree with God that we are all sinners. We've all failed God. We've all missed the mark. We've come to that agreement, and we've come to that agreement that the only way to have forgiveness and be a saint is through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus, his son, and walk in that relationship with him. And he speaks to us, and he loves us, and he cares for us. We come into that kind of a covenant. We come into that covenant with God, but we're also in that kind of a covenant with one another. For those who take of this table are singularly Christian. This table's not open for the secularist. It's not open for the Hindu or for the Buddhist or for the Muslim or for the atheist. This is the Lord's table. And those that he invites to come to this table are those whom he has received, those who have believed. And he says those that believe he will receive and will in no way cast out or cast away. So we have that covenant unity that's there reflected. But we also have what we call a communion unity. The Bible says here in uh, chapter 10, 16, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Well, the covenant is the coming together, and the communion is the sharing together. So, you know, I could, I could go and I could take of the cup by myself and I could have, you know, that covenant relationship expressed with God the Father and I could have communion expressed with God the Father through this by myself. But to a greater extent, when I take of the bread and I take of the cup and I'm in this kind of a room, that communion not only is between one of us and God, but it's between all of us. We're all walking together in covenant. We all can sing with, with the absolute assurance in our hearts. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which he has promised until that day. That's a good song, Matt. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. We walk together in that kind of a covenant, and we walk together in that kind of communion that we love him. And we love one another. And in that process, we become more like him and we reflect his glory. So what we have is the lordship, the sovereignty of Christ revealed in this table. Revealed around this table, we have the unity of God's spirit. And there's a requirement on our behalf. And the requirement is a requirement of purity. You know, so many times we, we treat the things of God as mundane. We, we, glide, we just glide right over. We speed past. We're in a hurry. And what God wants us to do is take that moment to examine ourselves, to look within. As a matter of fact, the, the apostle, he says in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. A third interpretation on this word body in this verse is it refers to me. It refers to you. You see, it's important to remember that Paul is referring to these people as saints. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can say this, I am a saint. I am a saint. Do you believe that? I mean, you're not, you know, you're not just a, you're more than a sinner saved by grace. 
You know, we need to get over that. I, I hear so many Baptists, and I don't know why it's Baptists that do this, and I are one. But I'm just a poor old sinner saved by grace. Listen, you're more than a poor old sinner saved by grace. You are a saint of the living God. You've been adopted into his family. Jesus Christ says that you are not just an heir. You are a joint heir with him in the kingdom. It means that you are a kingdom of priests. You're a kingdom of princesses and princesses. That's who you are. We've been washed, we've been cleansed, we've been purified by the precious blood of Calvary's Lamb. Now, what God wants us to do is he wants us to live like it. You know, my granddaughter, she's the prettiest little thing I've ever seen. But you should have seen her Valentine's night at our house. She didn't look too pretty. We sat around. Our Valentine tradition at our home is my wife does fondue. You know, it's a whole lot cheaper than going to that place out here. I'm not knocking the melting pot. I know it's supposed to be good, but it's a lot cheaper at home. And, uh, but, you know, she's got the melted cheese and the melted chocolate. She puts the broccoli and the asparagus in front of me to dip. But, you know, my granddaughter is a perfect example of what happens to us. By the time she had finished eating her strawberries dipped in that hot chocolate, Oh, man, it was on her face. And, and by the time Beverly said, y'all better watch it, it's going to get on her outfit, her clothes are covered in it. It was a mess. And, 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 and we get messy in life, do we not? We get defiled. We get dirty along the way. Sometimes we just miss the mark. I did something absolutely crazy yesterday. I let my, one of my sons talk me into playing golf. We had a tee time at 2.39. I'm thinking, well, the sun feels okay. It's not that bad. We got out there. Would you believe we tied yesterday? We never tie. I'm always at least 30 strokes in front of him. <laughs> but we tied because I was missing the mark yesterday. I couldn't putt to save my life. I mean, I'd get on the green in like a stroke, and then I'd putt 10 times. No, we weren't that bad, but it felt that bad. And you know why? It was because the reason I was missing the mark is because I was letting an outside element affect me. I was cold. I was shivering, you know. Have you ever tried to golf and shiver? It's ridiculous. I should have known better than to go on and play golf with 30-mile-an-hour winds at 52 degrees. Now, I know for our friends that watch these podcasts up north and around the country, you're thinking, 52 degrees. Let me tell you, in Destin, Florida, 52 degrees is wet and cold. It is wet and cold. But we're to examine ourselves. Okay, Lord, where did I miss it? Where do I have the smudge mark on my face? What, you know, what's that mark on, on me that I need to take and be washed through the blood of Christ Jesus? And Lord, what's that place that, that uh, you know, that I've just missed the mark on, that, that I, I need the power of the cross to pull me back in line and pull me back into the center of the altar? You know, for some of you this morning, it's, it's, it's a process of coming to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I mean, right now you can sense, I have this need in my life, and I've got this emptiness in my life, and, you know, I'm trying to fill it with, with every other thing. Isn't that what we do? I mean, we try everything before we try God. Even as Christians, when we know we need to simply turn to the Lord, we'll try everything else. But nothing else fits that slot. And right now, you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, how do you do that? It's not a matter of getting up and walking down the aisle and being paraded back and forth in front of the church. It's a matter of where you are, where you find yourself at the time, and you hear him calling you saying, yes, Lord, I receive and I respond. God, I know I need you. I ask you to come into my heart. That's what it means to believe. And be my Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of all this mess I've created in life. I take responsibility for it. I ask you, Lord, to be the Savior of my life. And I so believe you, God, that I ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be the sovereign 
Lord over me. Would you do that right now, Lord? Anywhere you pray that prayer when God's calling you, he said, as many as, as received him and called upon his name, those he received. So, you can do that. I had a friend many years ago, he prayed the most eloquent prayers that I've ever heard any man pray. His name was Hewlin Holcomb. Lived around the curve for me in Ball Ground, Georgia. I said that right. B-A-L-L-G-R-O-U-N-D, Ball Ground. Their northernmost city in Cherokee County, Georgia. It's where the Indians came and played ball, they say. But Hewlin. After he had returned from war, from World War II, had a post office job delivering mail on those rural routes, he said he crashed to the hill one day and it hit him that he needed to be saved. He said, Pastor, I pulled my truck over. He always drove a little blue truck. And he said, right there, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and to come into my life. And that's how I became a follower of Jesus. I'll never forget a little girl who got saved on a Sunday night after I'd preached. Her name was Paula Neighbors. And when she received Jesus Christ, she jumped up and she came running down the aisle. And my wife met her and prayed with her over a while. And she accepted Jesus Christ. I remember visiting a man by the name of Marvin Clayton at his home. And he was suffering through Christian defeat. He had a knife at his throat. Sheriff's deputies were gathered around. They'd called me to come and talk some sense into Marvin. And I talked to Marvin. Marvin put the knife down. And he just began to cry like a baby. He'd been walking in defeat as a Christian. He was a man of integrity, though. I remember one morning I called on Marvin to pray in the little church. Oh, I thought I was preaching to the world then, you know, 80 people in church. And I called on Marvin to pray. And he said, Preacher, I need to remove myself from leading in prayer because there's unconfessed sin in my heart. Wow. Can you imagine anybody doing that in this room? But that's what the Lord calls us to as we come to the table. No matter where we are, that we call upon his name. Whether we're on the road or in the church. That as as followers of Christ, whether we're defeated or whether we're sinful, that we'd be brought back into that kind of an alignment with the Lord. That we'd be one. So right now, before we take of these elements, I'm calling us to prayer. Just where you are, with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's going to be looking around. But I challenge you to pray. If you've never trusted Christ Jesus as to be your Savior and Lord, that at this very moment you'd ask Christ to come into your heart. And be your Savior and forgive you and cleanse you. You're tired of being dirty. You're tired of being run over. You're tired of the guilt. You're sick of the shame. And right now, Christ is entering into your heart. And you're praying to receive Jesus. And as he enters in right now, you're sensing a washing. With sincerity of heart, you're praying. And you're sensing a a lifting of the burden. And you ask him to be your Lord. And can I tell you that just now, you just got saved. Some of you are working and walking in defeat as followers of Christ. You're ready to give it up. Could I challenge you today to give it up at the foot of the cross? And say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to take this burden. I ask you to take this defeat and turn it into a victory.
You've said that all things work together for good to those who love you and they're called according to your purpose, and I believe that. Some of this junk's been going on, hadn't been too good, God, but I believe, I believe with all my heart that you can take it and you can turn it. Some of you that are walking with spots, would you pray and ask the Lord right now to remove the spots of, of sin and the missing the mark and make you whole and make you well and make you complete. Nobody's looking around. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. I just have one question I want to ask. If you just accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, I'd want to challenge you just to lift your hand for just a minute. Let me see it. Just so I can pray a prayer blessing over you. Amen. Somebody else? Amen. Amen. Just keep them up for just a minute. Amen. 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 Okay, I've seen you all across the room. I'm going to pray for you now as followers of Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people who have received Jesus Christ this morning to be their Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, that you spoke to their heart and that you entered therein. Lord, I ask you to give them your joy. I ask you to give them your peace. I ask you to give them your continued presence each and every day. Lord, thank you for the lifted burden that you've taken off their shoulders. Father, for the rest of these followers, I ask, Lord, that you would help them walk in victory. Help them walk as overcomers in this world. And Father, now... We've got brand new believers, we've got old believers, but we come together in the unity of spirit around this table with purified hearts, with a purified conscience before you. And we come to celebrate, to celebrate Jesus. He is the reason for this feast. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to come at this time to help with the passing of the elements.
The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, without the shedding of blood, there's, a, there's no remission, there's no removal, there's no forgiveness of sin for most all things are purified with blood. You know, I always wonder why the blood? The book of Genesis tells us that life is in the blood. And we go through a major transfusion when we trust Jesus Christ. As many of you have taken this morning, you've had that lift and that burden taken off and Christ come in. He said, as often as you take this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Okay, deacons, you guys can have a seat. I need a couple of counselors down front, please. This young man's an exception. We're going to invite you to stand with us, sing together. I'm forgiven, you are forsaken. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, should die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, it's my joy to honor you in all I do. music's playing softly there's a couple things i want you guys to be aware of some of you accepted christ you know you don't have to come down front but i just challenge you come on get with one of our counselors let us give you the things that you need to get on this christian journey and uh and that's cool the other thing is is i've got a couple of urgent prayer requests that i want us to pray over one is um josh feltner josh had a kidney transplant how many years ago has it been 13 Wow, and it's his brother Joe that gave him the kidney. They're twins, and uh, he was admitted to the hospital, high blood pressure, stuff going on, and we want to have a time of prayer for God to heal that situation. Second one, 32-year-old uh, member of our church, Giuseppe Dodd, um, he and his wife are in the Air Force, about to be uh, assigned to uh, outside of London and um, their furniture's packed up. It's been headed towards a boat. All of you military folks understand that. He had a massive heart attack last night, and uh, we want to remember him in our prayers. But, you know, there's others of you. you got anybody else have a prayer request you want us to? We're just going to have a special time of prayer before we go into these praises. Mona? Okay, son-in-law lost a job. How many of you have somebody with a job situation you want to pray for? Okay, health situations, family situations. There's room at the cross for every one of these. Room at the cross. John, would you lift these prayers up? John Needhammer is one of our elders. Let's bow our heads. Father, in each of our hearts this morning, there are burdens that you know what they are, and we have lifted some to you for health and uh, for jobs, for families that are in distress, for pains and suffering that seem to permeate throughout your people. Father, help us to remember that it is in prayer we find answers and peace in all these things that you are faithful each and every day, that 
your word will never fail us. So, Father, as we lift these needs to you, those that are hidden in our hearts and those that we've spoken, we beseech you, Lord, mm. that you would touch each need and in your way and in your power and in your grace and mercy, you will grant to us those things we are so undeserving of, and that is peace and joy in the difficulties of life. We do praise you, Lord. Thank you for those this morning that have lifted their hearts to you and have said, Lord, let me be yours. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. We're going we're gonna to wrap up with a song of celebration. You guys uh, that have trusted Christ, you feel free. Come on down. Somebody want to unite with the church. Some want to be baptized. You come on. We're going to wrap up with a couple songs. We're going to glorify God this morning and give him praise as we depart from his feast. As we, before we do that, we have one announcement. Pastor Steve may not have known about this announcement, but this, our beloved Pastor Steve Davies has a birthday this week. He turns 42 plus 15, 57. So we are happy and celebrate. He's a very young 57. I have to say that. I struggle keeping up with him. But I want to recognize Well, you know, I had a snowbird ask me if I was 42 earlier this morning. Okay, well, I mean. Word. There you go. So Ken Youngblood, one of our deacons, has a, a word to speak. Uh, Pastor, on behalf of our deacon chairman, Rick Ricketts, who's away this weekend, and our entire body of deacons and elders, we just want to wish you a happy birthday. We have a gift for you, and we just want you to thank you. We want to thank you for being our leader, our shepherd, our pastor. And uh, the Bible says that those that are over us, that we should respect them and esteem them highly. And we do, Pastor. We love well, thank you. you very and we much. thank you for being our pastor. Happy birthday. Thank you. God bless. Thank y'all so much. As Pastor Steve said, if you've made a decision and want to come and share that with the church, you come even as we sing. We're going to celebrate the Lord together. Alive forever. Amen. Let the children sing. It is a day of celebration, a day of joy, a day of fulfillment. Let the children sing a song of liberation. The God of our salvation set us free. Death, where is thy sting? The curse of sin is broken. The empty tomb stands open. Come and see. He's alive, alive, alive. Hallelujah. Alive. Praise and glory to the Lamb. He's alive. Worthy of our praise, worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King, worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise, worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King, worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise, worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. I'm alive, 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 hallelujah, alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. I'm alive, 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 hallelujah, alive forever, amen. I'm alive, 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 hallelujah, alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. I'm alive.
As you go, may God bless you. You're dismissed.